Welcome to St. Peter's Church. This National Historic Landmark and Active Episcopal Church has been here at the corner of 3rd and Pine Streets in Philadelphia continuously since 1761. Except for the tower and spire you can see here, it still looks mostly the same as it did when Pennsylvania was an English colony and this was an Anglican church or part of the Church of England. Over its long years, it has ministered to the surrounding community through many changes, providing a place of sanctuary and with its churchyard, a green oasis in the city. Let's look first at the outside. It's a plain brick building in the Georgian style of the day. There are four equal doors and at the east end, magnificent Palladian window. Its architect was Robert Smith, a young Scotsman who came to the colonies in 1748, clearly well-trained in the latest London styles. Philadelphia was founded by Quaker William Penn in 1681 as a refuge for those seeking an escape from religious persecution. Its center was at Market Street near the Delaware River. By the time St. Peter's was proposed, the prospering city was spreading south along the river into this area called Society Hill, where many of the city's wealthy merchants were building grand houses. Most were members of Christ Church, Philadelphia's first Anglican church, at 2nd and Market Streets. They were discouraged by overcrowding there and wanted a church closer to home. It took five years and a grant of land from the sons of William Penn to persuade the rector of Christ Church to let construction begin in 1758. When money was short, Benjamin Franklin organized a lottery to raise more money. Finally, the first service was held in September of 1761. The new church was an equal partner with Christ Church, and they were called the United Churches of Christ Church and St. Peter's. Now here's an early view of the church. You can see it's very much the same as it is today, but at that time there was a cupola on the roof which held two bells. It was not until after the two churches separated in 1832 that the present tower and spire were added. The original land grant included space for a churchyard that you see here. Both famous and lesser known people are buried here and it offers a green space filled with magnificent trees to this urban neighborhood. As we go into the church, you can see how basically plain it is. Painted white and with mostly clear glass windows, very much like a Quaker meeting house. Looking to the west end, you see before you the imposing pulpit, which is opposite the altar at the east end, an extremely rare arrangement for a church. This was the era of the Great Awakening, an evangelical movement that swept through the colonies in the early 1700s. It emphasized a direct relationship with God as found in the Bible and through preaching and prayers. So when St. Peter's was built, the pulpit with the reading desk below it where the Bible was read was designed to be the most important feature of the church. The altar was rarely used, so it became a secondary space at what was for them the back of the church. Notice that the pulpit is octagonal and shaped like a chalice or a wine glass, so very symbolic, and that it is raised up and projecting into the body of the church so that the preacher can see and be seen by almost everyone, whether seated on the ground floor or in the gallery above. Acoustics for preaching were very important. The ceiling is curved, and the canopy above the pulpit, called a glory, is a sounding board. It has a gilt sunburst on the underside. Above it, you can see what represents what the book of Exodus calls the pillar of cloud by day and the flame by night that led the Israelites through the desert to the promised land. All the way at the top of this classically decorated wall is the family crest of the Pens, recognizing their gift of the land for the church. A larger box pew was set aside for them up in the center of the South Gallery, like the Royal Box. These were very desirable seats up there, 
It's a lot warmer there in winter, and in the hot summer, the occupants would leave town for their country houses. It's interesting to note that the sons of Quaker William Penn were Anglicans. They and many other prospering Philadelphia merchants were turning away from Quaker plainness and modesty. A man named Benjamin Wincoop rented a box there near the Penns. He, like many of his fellow merchants, was a slave owner. In January of 1770, his enslaved man, Absalom, married Mary, probably in this church. She was enslaved to another member. In time, he was able to buy first her freedom, and then, in 1784, his own. Absalom Jones, the name he took, and Richard Allen, another recently freed slave and a Methodist preacher, started the Free African Society in 1787 to help freed people like them adapt to their new life. Jones started the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas on 5th Street near Locust, not far from here, in 1792 and became a priest in 1802. And in doing that, he became the first black American ordained to the Episcopal Church priesthood. Now, while it's exciting to think about a person like Jones living just near St. Peter's and perhaps even praying in our pews, the difficult truth is that St. Peter's was not a place where Jones found equality or freedom. Many early members of St. Peter's were influential Philadelphians, merchants, lawyers, generals, politicians, and slaveholders. Early church members Robert Morris and Thomas Willing <clears throat> were engaged in the slave trade, and other members held slaves, including John Cadwallader, Samuel Powell, and Benjamin Chu, who owned nine plantations in Delaware and Maryland. As such, St. Peter's Church was built and financed in large part by wealth that was directly or indirectly connected to slavery. Another remarkable feature of the church is its original box pews. Designed to keep the heat in, they're raised off the stone floor and have doors and carpeting. It was pretty cold in this church in the wintertime, and the services were long. Members would bring foot warmers with coals from the home fireplace, since the services could la run as long as three hours. Because we needed to, and still do, face in both directions in our services. The box pews were never removed when central heating was introduced, as was done in most 18th century churches. The pews were rented to families or individuals, uh, and the most expensive ones were in the center aisle and in the south gallery. This pew, number 41, was rented yearly by Samuel and Elizabeth Powell, he was the mayor of Philadelphia just before and just after the American Revolution. Their elegant Georgian house on 3rd Street is now a house museum. George and Martha Washington lived no next door to them at times during the late 18th century, and they became good friends. They often came to church together. Now, the Church of England in America had a difficult time as the movement for independence from Britain took hold in the 1770s. The temporal head of the church was King George III, so it was difficult for the ministers in the colonies to know what to do because not only were they sworn to support the king, but their church members were divided over whether to be loyal to the king or to the patriot side. When the British came to occupy the city of Philadelphia in the fall of 1777, all but one of the six clergy members in the area left town, including the rector of the United Churches. The only one who stayed was the assistant rector, William White. Then in the late 1780s, he went on to create the Episcopal Church as an American version of the Anglican Church. It has the same liturgy or services, but a system of government very much like the new American Republic which was being created here in Philadelphia at the same time. White gave his last sermon from this pulpit shortly before his death in 1836 at the age of 88. At the east end of the church, you can see the original 18th century altar, a plain table. 
The fancier carved mahogany chairs were made in the late 18th, late 18th century. The one to the left of the altar has the bishop's mitre or hat, indicating that this is where the bishop sits when in the church. Looking up above the altar, you see the Rococo-style organ case made by Ger German craftsman Philip Fering, with wood carving by the French-born master craftsman Martin Jugis, who also did the wood carving on and behind the pulpit. Originally, the choir and the organ console were placed in front of the case, but when the current Ernest Skinner organ console was installed in 1931, space was needed for 3,000 organ pipes behind the case, so the choir pews and the console were moved downstairs where they are to this day. The organ is often accompanied by the beautiful sound of the St. Peter's Choir, which began in 1868 as a boys' choir. Today the choir is intergenerational and includes boys, girls, and adults. And looking on either side of the organ case, you can see the statues Exhortation on the left and Praise on the right. They were made by William Rush, one of America's first sculptors. Now, in these old photographs, look at the stained glass windows above the altar and in the West Gallery. With the return to early Catholic practices in the 1840s, the focus of worship turned to the altar. Instead of tearing down the old-fashioned church, as some people wanted to do, it was done over to look dark and gothic. You can see in these old photographs the interior woodwork painted dark brown, the walls an ochre color, and stained glass in all the downstairs windows. In the 1970s, the church was restored to its original look, but the memorial plaques all around the church, which began to be installed in the 19th century, were kept. And we kept a, these few windows just to show that they were part of our history. Today, our services start at the west end with the Bible readings, the prayers, and the sermon, and then we turn to the east for the communion service. We hold baptisms in the center aisle with a late 18th century font. Finally, have a look at the tower and spire of the church I mentioned at the beginning. Added in 1842, 10 years after the separation from Christ Church, they were designed by William Strickland, America's first native-born architect. The tower houses a set of eight bells from London's Whitechapel foundry. The spire is a few feet taller than the Christchurch Tower, perhaps our own Declaration of Independence. Our bells are still played most Sundays, unlike another one in the neighborhood with a big crack in it. We hope you've enjoyed your visit to St. Peter's. In historic Philadelphia, we focus a lot on the American Revolution, but this church has been here before, during, and almost two and a half centuries after, and we are still going strong. Ours is a congregation that values its history and is also active and forward-looking. We tell the difficult parts of our history in order to be honest and to learn from our past mistakes. As a major part of this truth-telling, we are committed to being an anti-racist community. Thank you very much for joining me at Historic St. Peter's today. And do join us for services. For more information about them and more, please visit our website, and you can find there information on the cell phone audio tours of the church and the churchyard, and a place to contact us with your questions or comments.